So I guess I'm ready to go. Uh, how is the mic? Does it even work? Okay, guys, can you hear me in the back? Even if I, yes, okay, cool. But do you think you hear me through the mic or just because I'm yelling? No, you, I know that for you it's yelling for everyone else. Uh, the people on Zoom hear me well as well. I mean, sorry, again, there's a technical issues with each new room. So, okay, guys, welcome everyone to this uh, CS, whatever, to the A10, right? Computer system organization. Actually, I didn't change the slide. Uh, okay, let's, uh, today is uh, kind of an introduction. So, we will, I will try to explain why we're doing this class and uh, what is coming, how hard it is, uh, stuff like that. And then we will start mostly on Wednesday. Um, and again, I want some confirmation from Zoom people that you guys can hear. Uh, actually, I'm recording this video uh, and I will set up a live stream as well. You can, I mean, you can join Zoom, but maybe we'll just uh, do a YouTube video as well at some point. Uh, Zoom people, can you say thumbs ups or something? Yeah, I can hear. Okay, cool. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, okay, then back to the slides. So what's going on here? So we, it's a pretty large class, so 203 people as of morning today, and I the room is almost full. I mean, I'm pretty sure someone, some people will draw, uh, but nevertheless, I mean, it's uh, relatively high for the University of Utah. So my name is Andrew Burtsov. So what is that? So who am I? So I actually build operating systems. Uh, I'm not an architect, but I'm just one level up. So. Uh, since 2000, when I was kind of your age, uh, bachelor's degree in, in Ukraine, I started building operating systems and I still build them. And I, I contributed to a bunch of uh, uh, projects. Uh, L4 is one of the famous and the very first fully formally verified microkernel. Uh, I was lucky to work with the team uh, as a student actually. Uh, did something for them, built this microitron specification for them. As a PhD student, I built this deterministic replay engine for Xan. And Xan is a virtual machine, if you don't know, which was used by Amazon, but Amazon created their own cloud. And then later on, in a, there was a fight between uh, Xan versus KVM, which is part of Linux now. But nevertheless, this uh, deterministic replay means that I was able to record execution of the entire system, which is inside the VM. And then I was able to replay it back, mostly for debugging and analysis purposes. But it's a lot of low level engineering. And uh, we still build it. So we still build, it, build those systems with my team. So we're always looking for students if you're suddenly interested. Right now, working on three new operating system. Redleaf is uh, in the best shape among the three. So it's a clean slate uh, microkernel build in Rust, actually, to explore the benefits of uh, language-based isolation compared to hardware isolation. But we have a couple of other ones. So Redshift is uh, OS, which believes that in the future, we're not going to be running our software around uh, general purpose CPUs, but we'll inherently rely on accelerators, GPUs, programmable hardware like FPGA, some custom silicon. And the question is how the operating system will, will look in this new, new age. And Horizon is a new secure hypervisor, kind of like in which you own your data, which is which sounds like science fiction. And it is still, but maybe in the future, it will not be. So, you know, when your Roomba with a camera, rounds around your floor, taking picture of you, supposedly never sending them anywhere. Uh, in Horizon, we'll have a guarantee that those pictures are still never sent anywhere. Or even if they send to the cloud for some processing like doing this simultaneous localization and planning, which Roomba is doing supposedly, uh, you still own them and you as a user can, can have a guarantee. So it's fun. I mean, uh, my main area is operating systems, but this is just what's below me. And today I will try to convince you that, you know, it makes sense or it doesn't even make sense. It's just kind of an essential knowledge. So what will be covered in this class it will not make you a god of, you know, of modern computer science, but you will be often one paper away from understanding what's going on. Because with, without this knowledge, which is in this class, uh, you will not be able to understand what the hardware is doing underneath. So... I think we have at least 40 years, but I think we actually have more. Uh, you obviously know where we meet. Uh, our main communication mechanism will be Piazza. 
So there's a link on uh, on uh, what's that canvas, right? So on canvas, I actually I put up. Uh, so you probably read through it and uh, so we will use canvas as a scheduling mechanism because i know that you have multiple classes and every time we have a homework i'll put a deadline on on piazza right oh sorry on canvas but uh all the discussion is on piazza i'm pretty sure that's familiar to everyone right because everyone is doing the same uh homework assignments will be on grade school again i think i sign up everyone in grade school uh, I don't think I had a way of signing up people from this class uh, on Piazza. So please go ahead and sign up uh, sooner the better, the better. But all official announcements will be through so if you on Piazza. It's okay. But Piazza is, is the place to ask a question. And I'm pretty sure that you guys will have your own Discord. Uh, if you invite me, I will join. Uh, but uh, if you want to talk to TAs and myself, just send us a private message on Piazza or public question if you want to help with homework and whatnot, right? So get back here for a sec. Uh, we'll have a web page here, which is which exists actually as of five minutes ago. And this is where I will be putting all the lecture slides and videos, right? So I'm unfortunately a last minute person, but I still managed to export my today slice to PDF. I will try to make it a little bit earlier, or at least like export a draft. But you can click here so you will get access to the PDF. If you want to do annotation on them, go ahead, print them. The closer to the class deadline, the, the better because you have a higher chance of getting the most, you know the most updated version of the slide. Sources are also available. So if you need something from like the actual slide deck, it will be there. Uh, the repo for the class will be available as well. And the video will be posted uh, here after every lecture, right? So you will be able to review uh, later on as we move towards towards uh, like midterm and final, right? Uh, what else? It's OK. So a little bit of what is coming in this class. So I don't think that it will be extremely hard. So my operating system class is hard. And people say maybe the hardest they ever took uh, when they are like undergraduate career. But this one shouldn't be that hard. And uh, in general, you know, I wouldn't worry too much about grades. I'm, I'm a lenient grader, right? So I don't believe that grades should, be, should motivate you. The real goal is to kind of Made you by the need to acquire this knowledge so you can go there in the field, make money uh, by being in this class, right? So don't get scared about grades or anything. Don't worry too much. Typically, I mean, I that's I, I taught once at the University of Utah, uh, maybe seven years ago, and I came back and I will be teaching constantly, right? So I just rejoined. Uh, before that, I was at the University of California, Irvine. I have this wonderful teacher. Uh, the thing is that you can go on and search, and typically, you know, my grade distribution is uh, better than many, despite the fact that the classes are very, very hard. So usually, like, grades are not a problem. But what's coming in this class is falling. So we will do uh, around eight to 10 small homework assignments, which will follow the lecture. So those are mostly like kind of like pen and paper on grade school, right? Not super hard, but still you need to understand what's what's happening in the lectures. And it's kind of to force you to follow the lectures, right? Uh, and we will have a couple of lab-like assignments, maybe one or two, for which you will require to SSH to a Unix server and you know type some C-like commands or maybe program in C a little bit. Why is that? Because I want to give you some exposure to real hardware, kind of like, okay, I will ask you a question, like how many cycles this specific thing takes and you have to I can call that specific thing and uh, and measure and I mean I'll, I'll teach you how so don't worry about it but it's it's a it's a nice skill to to know how long it takes to for example fetch a uh, value from a key value store depending on the size stuff like that uh, then midterm final again all the grades are curved I don't have a if you don't get you know ninety nine or ninety five or even eighty five doesn't mean doesn't mean much. The question is like, how do you behave? How, where are you relative to the rest of the class, right? So 
the way a curve, the top score gets 100, and then we go down, right? So, but again, usually, and so don't worry about again, like, Typically, I mean, again, in this class, I guess curving will not be as, 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 as aggressive because probably the class is not that hard. But again, don't worry, but just keep track of where you are with respect to the rest of the class. So, and the distribution graph, again, maybe will change over so 30%, midterm 30%, final 40%. Uh, out of those assignments, you can drop two if you choose that you can't finish three times. Be careful, right? Two is not that much out of 10. Um, you have to be, and I mean, I might excuse you, like if you're one second late, but you know what submissions are <laughs> zero, right? Just because you have this drop option, and it became popular recently in in many classes, I guess, is because people don't want to deal with late uh, late submissions because it like delays the grading, like we have to track who who does what and stuff like that, right? So again, we're gonna use the book. Which will be Henderson Patterson, computer organization and design, either the fifth edition or the sixth edition. They're close enough so you don't have to buy a new one. Um, and let me stop here for a sec. Are there any organizational questions for now? All good? Pretty typical. Yeah. yeah. So when you say something is uh, when it's late, it's zero. At what point, like if something's due at midnight, if something turned at 12.30, is that still zero? Or? Yeah, no, it, it will be like, it will be usually 11.59. Okay. And if it's 11.59 or one, I think, uh, it will be automatic submission, right? Most of the time. Yeah. Um, uh, the ah, yeah, forgot to mention exams are open book. Again, that's, I don't think we have to memorize a lot of stuff. So the goal is to get to understanding. What is open book here? Like, what are you about to bring? Good question. In the past, I was allowing to bring anything but the internet and communication. Most likely that will be. So the I could bring electronic devices, but turn off the internet on my mobile. Correct. Correct. Okay. And you can search, you can type, you can do that. You can search through just again. I don't see a reason in forcing you to memorize anything. So. If you have understanding, you know where it is. It's up to me to create an exam, which is challenging enough for you to, to distinguish your grade from your peer. Typically, it's easier, in my opinion. So, like, if I took notes on a tablet, I could use that on the exam. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and it just has like a PDF open on the. Uh, right, correct. And you can search with the PDF. So, in the past, uh, like, literally anything no no personal communication or no why no internet it's kind of funny because originally it was open internet as well but then people started searching and you know the the answers which they get back are they can go on some kind of comic book it's it's funny <laughs> yeah and uh so that's why i close it so just uh, just to avoid this like, ridiculous answers any other questions? This is a good one, actually. Yeah. So open. Typically, we stay pretty open in in, in my classes. Just anything anything else? I think you can either choose or I can drop the lowest in the end, right? So it's easier. Uh, like if they will be weighted, then we we'll, we have to discuss how it works. Like maybe weighted minimal. Or something. Any any anything else? Okay, good. So a brief overview of topics. Uh, so we're kind of done with uh, uh, presentation of part. So I think essentially the the goal is to teach you is what's inside the machine, right, and how it works. Uh, it can be a laptop, can be a phone, can be a a server and a data center, they're kind of conceptually similar. And of course, I mean, I have only so much time, so I can't teach you for real how like a specific, you know, the, the, the current generation of x86 works, right? But uh, we'll come reasonably close that you can reason about it. So again, it's hard for me to, as well. So like uh, people who are at the cutting edge of this discipline, you know, they fall. The people who people who have come up with this meltdown inspector attack, they are kind of very cool so they are in the loop all the time and you you meet them on the street so like they are not kind of like detached from us but they exist right so but unless you're doing that on a daily basis it becomes hard so and 
I, I'm behind maybe like, you know, like a couple of years. Uh, and then I, when I do a project in this area, I catch up. But again, and catch up was painful. But uh, there, because there is a lot, there's like layers and layers of hardware, which you have to understand and like software as well. But at least it will bring you closer and you will at least understand what's underneath. And if I, in my operating system class, the goal is to, when you type something like print app, hello world, I will ask you what's going on, like what is actually happening. And in this class is uh, one layer, one level below, like what is happening on the, in the CPU, at least in some simplified version of the CPU, right? But which is not too far off. And so we will take a look at the MIPS assembly language. Uh, MIPS is convenient. It's, uh, why is it convenient? It's convenient because it's the encoding is so simple that you can actually build. I mean, we're not going to build, but at least we will draw the wires and you will understand how to build this MIPS five stage pipeline. And this, this simplicity is appealing. So it's a good model for, for learning, right? It's like the representation of arithmetic numbers, uh, how all the instructions work, basics of pipelining, essentially kind of five stage pipeline. And then go a little bit towards like uh, a real uh, deeper pipelines, which we use today in those machines, right? Uh, later on in the class. And the important topics here are this like memory hierarchies to understand, okay, how long it takes to, to access memory, because it's today it's the major bottleneck. We'll talk a little bit about accelerators, kind of like GP, GPUs are organized, just so you know that again. If someone asks you a question, can you do this on a GPU? At least you know what, what you have to read quickly to understand what it what what uh, what you need to do. And uh, finally, again, I mentioned meltdown inspectors, so I hope we'll get to them because I mean, how many people, I mean, I guess everyone heard about meltdown inspector, right? The question, how many people understand how they work? No people, one, okay, one. <laughs> Uh, good. So, how many people heard about meltdown inspector? Two attacks. Oh man. Okay, I wasn't surprised. That, uh, yeah, I was. I was. I was thinking like uh, the whole class. So these are like two, <laughs> two, two attacks, which became. I mean, for many, for decades, security researchers like, suspected that those attacks are possible. In brief, meltdown allows you to read the memory of the kernel. Which is typically, you know, protected by the operating system because you can have a secret there, right? Like a private key or something. And uh, Spectre allows you to read memory of another process. And they, like it, it became very powerful. They came out uh, maybe three, four years ago, and uh, they just changed the world essentially. Like essentially, like imagine running this machine, but it's completely insecure or running in that data center. For me, okay. Well, maybe my um, credit card details will get stolen because you know I have the credit card open, my bank page open, one web browser page, and uh, navigated to some malicious website, another, and suddenly that gets gets stolen. But imagine you're doing financial transactions in a data center, then you're really scared, right? So uh, you had to question. Spectre is where they're able to hijack the ghost process. Spectre yes. allows you to read memory of another process. Yeah. Meltdown allows you to read the memory of a kernel, and then there will there were follow ups. Uh, it's it's kind of the must have knowledge today because uh, you might you might deal with it. So you might have to build uh, algorithms which are which is called oblivious, meaning that they can, uh, uh, the the behavior of the algorithm does not depend on the input, for example. Um, and it's again, it's just again defense against a specific subset of those attacks. But understanding meltdown inspector and what this mitigation imply is, is is necessary. And so again, the trick is that to understand meltdown inspector, you have to take the entire class. That's why it will come at the very end. And I hope you will get it because typically people get it. I mean, inherently it's very simple. If you follow the class and you understood everything, then you know it's kind of a logical conceit. And it's brilliant. It will just blow your mind. This, when, it, when I read Meltdown, it was just wow. There was a couple of like, uh, I don't know how many people know return oriented, oriented programming, ROP. So it's essentially a technique which allows you to build the Turing complete computation by just returning uh, and using the stack computation. Uh, it's like exploitation technique which allows you to execute anything without changing the code of your program because it's read only, so you can't change it typically, right? 
it was eye-opening and meltdown is equally eye-opening okay so cool so that's the overview any any quick questions feel free to interrupt me anytime by, by, by. Yeah. Uh, are you going to cover like how we support like different types of like uh, ah yeah so but every time we will do something and um every time we'll do a lecture there will be a chapter uh, which will be an assigned reading is that is is that the answer yeah i mean so i was looking at your syllabus mm -hmm. and i think the first two classes are like chapters one would you want us to read all of chapter four or would you want to read this section of the section like, <laughs> like the second day is called the and i noticed in the book it says there's a section that says measure yeah, and you will probably understand where we are. I, to be honest, I mean, I read it yesterday I'll just just again, just to. I mean, and it's 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 an okay read, so it's it gets a little bit detailed sometimes. I would say read it; it's not as hard. But uh, uh, and but I don't know what it what it means to be to, to be hard for me and hard for you, right? So when I was a kid like you, it was harder to read those books. Now they look easy, right? So I don't really know. Uh, I would say. It's uh, if there is some irregularity in, in, in how we go versus the book, I will probably try to to alert you. But I would say just read. Uh, usually, sequential reading of the book uh, is the best approach. If I just because I mean those guys, Hennessy and Patterson, they are kind of the gods of this discipline, right? So they invented MIPS and RISC and uh, or RISC and CISC, right? Uh, and uh, uh, they're fun guys and this is like sixth edition so they kind of polished it a little bit so i kind of agree with what they what they wrote in the other book which is for graduate level it gets kind of like gets too far into the woods so i'm not like entirely sure i like it that much but this so does this answer the question yeah so you want to basically like read the chapter yeah I, yeah I, I would read after the lecture kind after, of after the first or the second Ah, after each lecture, <laughs> what do yeah. we have here? Like Let me just <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, much. Uh, I'll help you, I guess. So don't <laughs> don't, don't, don't worry. <laughs> I, I I did expect so many questions about how how to read the book, right? I hope it's easier than it sounds. Is there anything really important in the sixth edition that isn't in the fifth edition? I I don't know the difference that much. I looked at them; they look almost identical. Yeah, so I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't go and buy a new one. So I'm pretty sure. Um, I just want to ask the class: Has anyone found like? PDF book online for free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? No. <laughs> yeah. Make sure that I am going to buy it. Make sure that it's somewhere else. It has a Experience since it's like first time after a break, so I don't really know. Uh, I have my versions, these have like hard versions. Mm -hmm. can... uh, but the book is a fun read, you know, because uh, okay, so like a little bit of uh, personal experience. So I was teaching classes without a book, and it's nice, but then it gets a little bit abstract because no matter how hard I try to put everything in the lecture, I cannot write because I'm. I have my own vision of what's going on. I put something in the lecture, but it's always nice to read it again in a book, and it will help you to understand what's going on. I kind of solidify knowledge and reading this. It's a fun book, again. But if you have to read 10 of those, then of course, yeah, uh, in each class, you, you guys are suffering. OK, anything else? All good? OK. So this we did. Okay, lectures obviously we're already kind of in in one of them, so we we know what's happening. Hopefully, like recorded. Supposedly everything works right now. Live stream. I forgot my wonderful camera, which I can put here, so you don't have to look at my chin all the time. But 
we'll be looking at something else as well. Uh, and Hennessy and Patterson, maybe some additional notes, homeworks, exams, open notes, right? So good question about open notes. So probably that's the end of the overview here, right? So come on, questions. Yeah, questions, we already had questions, right? So now back to business. So again, back to why do we have to take this class? So does anyone have a version for me? Okay, why did you guys take it? Like anyone, <laughs> is there a reason? Required class? <laughs> yeah, I know. But again, my goal now is to, is to change it. Like, for practical reasons. Yeah, good. <laughs> so my goal is to make sure that instead of like being a required class, it's, it's, it could be an elective and you should have still elect it. Okay, so that's kind of your life, I'm pretty sure. That's where you are, kind of, most of you, right? So you learn a couple of languages. You probably know more languages than I do at this point. Or you're way better in them. And you have your wonderful Google C uh, uh, VS Code, right? I chose Rust on purpose, just to kind of troll you a little bit. Uh, Rust is hard, so how many people know Rust? Uh, one. <laughs> Yeah, but anyway, so this is where you are. And that's fine. This is what is the CS degree is about at this level. The question is like, can you make a next step? And this is what we're doing here. Meaning, can you build whatever you were building on that other screen fast or secure? And I'll give you a couple of examples, uh, which will try to convince you that, okay, it's not as easy to build the fast software these days. It used to be a little bit easier back in the days when I was young, my main job was essentially, okay, compilers were just kind of sucky. And I have, if I write something in assembly, I'm the god. Like, you know, everything runs fast. Everyone looks at me, you know, like rate tracers run fast. Everything runs fast, as long as you can handle assembly. But today, compilers are good. You know, they, they generate code, which is better than I usually write by hand in assembly, unless there is some kind of a specific trick which compiler cannot guess, because it's semantic trick, right? So you know something about the code. So here's one example join again i don't know how many people took a database class let me just grab my pen here so i will explain you briefly what this what this join is about uh, thing. so who can tell me what database join is it's when you're basically trying to cross reference in like a relational database and bring in data from multiple tables based on yeah so imagine you have two tables maybe one of them is students we call them canonically R, uh, and another is S, something else. Maybe that's the cities where they live. Each table has a key. So for example, one, one, two, three, four. That's a unique key. It can happen multiple times, so it's not a unique. Uh, here we have uh, maybe one, seven, five, let's say three, and that's about it. So, and this is A, B, C, D, E, F, I forgot the alphabet after that. What's next? H. H, and next? I. I, oh, thank you. You're better than me in alphabet. So join means that you select a record with the matching key, so one and one, and you output something like one, A, F, right? The next one with join says one, B, F. And you obviously, you say, look, uh, if it's a student A and B and they live in the city F, so it kind of makes sense, right? Uh, two doesn't join with anything. Three joins with I. So it will be three, D, and I, right? And nothing else joins, looks like, right? Agree? Uh, so does anyone know how to, what's the algorithm? How to build a join? Anyone took a database class? Go ahead. Yep, you can go. Select from where? Oh man, this is how you type. This is this. <laughs> no, how if you're a database engineer and you build the engine, and this is what you have in memory, two tables. How will you select as a language level in the compiler into some kind of a computation? What kind of computation is that? Yeah, row stored in. Like a hash map or something based on the key? Can be. Why not? 
we can do this, right? Yeah. But so you didn't take database classes yet. Okay, so one of the fastest joins which you can build is the following. So you, for example, kind of similar to what you were saying, you say, I'll scan the table R just linearly from one field, two, three, and I will create a hash table, right? And uh, it will contain entries for like for one, this will be your key, and those will be your values, A and B and stuff like that. And you will handle duplicates for somehow, right? So after that, you have this hash table and you say, oh, okay, if I scan this one, I can again look up against this hash table. So if I have one and I have a find, then it's a join, right? If I have a, if I look up and uh, there is nothing, then it doesn't join, right? So essentially it's, it's kind of very, very simple. And it's surprisingly one of the fastest ways to build this join. Essentially, you get the point. So scan the first one, uh, populate the hash table, then scan the second, uh, second relation, and while scanning, look up the element in the hash table, right? Agree? Works. Uh, there are different ways to do that as well. So here is how it works. So some team, a good team, build a version of this join. And they were wasting roughly 600 cycles per tuple right on the single core and i will explain what the cores are single cpu right another team comes in authors of this paper they say our code and then suddenly like they change the implementation without changing the algorithm at all right and they suddenly spend only 100 cycles and that's the goal of this class can you do this trick can you guess why the other one was 600 and this one is 100 no algorithmic knowledge, all that I kind of like algorithmic optimizations are again, they are the must because sometimes they, you know, they get rid of a complex order. And you know, it's on a scale, you will never beat this. But if the, the scale is small and the constants are high, you have to understand how to optimize the code. So, does anyone have a guess why is it 600 and why this is 100? The implementation was kind of. Similar to what I described, okay. you have is a caching problem. Caching problem. So, what is a caching problem? Uh, so, your CPU needs to fetch information really quickly. So, if it's in the cache, then you do that in less cycles. Correct. So, do you know how many how many cycles it takes to read a cache? Anyone? How? Okay, there are multiple. There is a caching hierarchy. A lot. Say again. Fifty-nine. Fifty-nine cycles. <laughs> Uh, which level of the hierarchy? <laughs> you, you are correct, but it's the bottom. So the first cache, they are growing. They are kind of like a, uh, L1 is a, a 32 kilobytes, and it takes to read two to three cycles. L2 is roughly, uh, let's say, 512 kilobytes, and it takes to read seven to maybe 12 cycles. L3 is, okay, who can tell me, like, this is kind of important to understand. L3, what is the size of L3, do you even know? On a server machine. It's actually, again, it kind of like changes your perception. L3 can go up to, they usually go one megabyte per core. So if you have a 40 core machine, it's 40, 40 megabytes. When I got my first machine for which I paid like astronomical amount of money as a student, it had 16 megabytes of DRAM. Now your last level cache is twice as big as my, my machine's DRAM, right? So let's say 32 megabytes. So if you're clever, you can actually put the entire workload or the working set of your program into the last level cache, right? And this is exactly the reason. So again, this hash table, which I was trying to build here, if it's big, let's assume a gigabyte, only 32 megabytes of it fit in the last level cache. And then you kind of screw it, right? Because then you go to memory. So how, by the way, so how long it takes you, you think it takes to, to, to read data from memory? Imagine you, data is not in a cache anywhere. 200 cycles, that's a good guess. And it's, that's realistic. So it's two to 400. So depending on where you are in the memory hierarchy. How much is it for L3? L3 is, so yeah, good question. So remember I said you're correct. So it's like roughly like 50. So we can say 50. Uh, I would say 35 to 50 cycles, right? 
And uh, we'll come back to it because it's just an intro. So it's kind of to, get to, to give you a feeling of what's coming, right? But you're right. So surprisingly, unless you do algorithmic tricks, this hash table, which I built here, this red one, will not fit in memory because it's two relations, like let's say one, this one is one gigabyte and this one, one gigabyte. And we can take smaller numbers, but they are in the ballpark. They don't fit in memory. So every time you do a lookup, you're paying a price because you typically go on a pseudo random order because this is how the data comes. Your hashing function randomizes it, right? So well, on every access, you will pay 200 cycles, right? Let me just think that. 200 cycles, right? <clears throat> So the question is, why is it six? Something must be wrong. Is it two guys guys to build it, right? It's what? like there are three accesses, right? And you had a... Yeah, I was going to say it was a four access. And that's kind of exactly the reason. So because the way they build the hash table in this specific uh, example, and again, just one example, the way they build it is they said, okay, there will be a hash table, that's their implementation at the top, which will contain a pointer array. And those will be going to like, here they implement kind of a linked list for tuples, right? And here they can, they have a lock because they want to scale to multiple CPUs right here, up to eight, for example, in this implementation, right? So they have to apply to acquire a log. Go ahead. Ah, uh, you know, like we, it, was it like that all the time or just recently? Yeah, probably. So my, my wonderful recording of today, right? I forgot to say share this, share screen. Almost. Thank you. Uh, there we go. I, uh, like, uh, if someone is not muted, can you mute, please? So it's kind of lame because we didn't record any of the slides. But uh, next time, like uh, people on Zoom, if you don't see my screen, start screaming right away, right? Okay. Uh, so the problem here is the following, right? So this is one access, access to access the spin lock. I don't know how much you know about spin locks, but it's a way to synchronize uh, access between multiple cores. Because if you try to insert into this free list, right, for multiple cores, there will be a conflict, right? So you need to do this once. Then obviously you access here, and then you access here once or twice, right? So, and that gives you these three accesses. And this is where this course comes in, kind of combined with the rest of your computer science education. You say, look, okay, that's not okay. If I have a hash table, which does not fit in the last level cache, and then by extension in the first level cache, you can, you can think about it. Uh, you say, okay, I'll rewrite it like this. This will be one cache line. So where we will have a header, which will contain both the lock and maybe some representation of this linked list, but that's one cache line. And then it kind of reduces you to one axis. So that's just one optimization. There is also an algorithmic optimization in this database joins. But again, this is kind of the flavor. Without understanding the memory hierarchy, without understanding those numbers which I uh, provided here, you can't reason about it. If I, my favorite question I will ask you, okay, I will put, put a piece of code and I will ask you how many cycles it takes. And then, because you don't even know whether it's fast or slow, what is 600? It looks fast, right? So, but on the other hand, you can say, okay, I can execute 600 instructions and 600 cycles, often more, right? Because you execute like 1.5 or something like that, right? Yeah. The code will be hitting on one screen. It's like one if acquire spin lock. So it's like 20 instructions or something like that, right? So one example, another example here, which is kind of fun. So uh, I'm open the web browser and hopefully it will run. So I wanted to show you. So this example is about virtualization and everyone knows what virtualization is. Everyone is excited about it. Um, in a browser. 
Linux. Linux. Says Alpine, right? 322, not bad. X86. Wait for a little bit. Takes longer than expected, to be honest, but hopefully it will come through. Boot it into Linux. World, kind of like a full distribution of Linux. We waited for maybe what, 20 seconds, maybe less, right? So what just happened inside web browser, it's not a shell. We really emulated x86 CPU. Uh, is at least Solar, he's a clever guy. And he plans, it's implemented in JavaScript. It emulates the CPU. It kind of runs reasonably fast. You can, like, I don't know. Uh, I don't even type find anymore. But you just admit that it's it's a little bit of a lag, but but not horrible. The question is like, do you think you can build a piece of software which puts Linux in a in a web browser and which runs as in at, at not near native, but maybe 2x performance slowdown? And how to build it? So that's kind of fun. Let's kill this one here and we'll go back to the slides. There is a nice paper about it. So there is a slightly different project, which is called Box. So Box is an emulator. So it em emulates a machine, right? And those two guys who are one of the lead developers of Box decided, okay, let's optimize it because they were looking at the numbers and the original version took 882 seconds to boot Windows. And it was, it was quite a bit of years ago, right? So it's Windows XP. And they managed to optimize it 10 times to this number, in which Windows, and I mean, it's similar to how I just booted in the web browser, but it's just a C implementation, uh, boots in 81 seconds. So what do you think they did? What kind of tricks they, what, what was the performance bottleneck for them? If you get to like, you know, maybe tomorrow, if you get hired and someone says, okay, optimize box for me. I mean, to be honest, I didn't know either. It's kind of tricky, but it comes with experience. If from their paper, they claim that, you know, post branch misprediction as a biggest cause of emulation performance. Uh, you have to re re really read the paper and I kind of encourage you to do that. So the link was here. So if you click on it, you will get land on the paper and it's, a, it's an easy, relatively easy read, right? It's a little bit surprising because you say, look, you probably heard that branchy code is a bad thing, but here it was kind of like killing them. So essentially just because they were running those emulation of x86, there was a, a ton of if conditions. Say, okay, if it's this instruction, I decoded it like that, then do this. If it's something else, do that. And there is a thing which is called the branch predictor, which predicts in the CPU. Because a mispredicted branch takes you on this specific CPU, introduces a 20 cycle penalty. So if you mispredicted the branch and essentially you execute the code, kind of like if some condition here, you execute A, else you execute B, right? And the branch, when it takes you like a couple of cycles to figure out this condition, right? And so the CPU predicts the way you will go, makes a prediction, very kind of high, up to 97% accurate prediction. And if you mispredict, you pay a penalty of 20 cycles. Apparently it's bad enough to slow you down here, right? And they talk about other techniques which they use, but it's kind of, again, it's kind of an interesting observation that unless you understand the branch predictors, or at least understand that they exist and they can uh, can be wrong, right? You don't really know what to do. Okay, so done with my examples. So now let's take a look at why why is it really hard? Why what has changed? As I was saying, when I was younger, life was actually easier. So the problem was that uh, the problem is, I guess, is that uh, if this is your uh, relative performance of your CPU for quite a bit of time here for almost 20 years it was doubling every two years so roughly speaking you could just write something some piece of software 
and just say, okay, buy new hardware. By the time we will complete this project, you know, it will be like twice as fast as with. So don't worry about optimizing. And it was fun. So it was era when you were able to do both the hardware was getting better, right? So essentially the transistors were getting smaller, the frequency was going up, uh, and the compilers were getting better in a way, but it's not about compilers, the specific graph, right? But mostly about the frequency uh, at which your CPU is running, the size of your transistors and microarchitectural innovation. So kind of like better branch predictors, better pipelines, right? And so this was your golden age. You didn't have to worry much. Here, unfortunately, we kind of hit a, what is called a power wall. So essentially, after you hit something like your CPU is 100 to 150, takes 100 to 150 watts, you can still dissipate heat with, with a sink, which is cheap, right? But uh, if you go above, then it will start breaking and melt eventually, right? So you need a more expensive cooling solution, which is uh, not viable in, in production scale, right? And so essentially we started thinking about, okay, we can't really grow the frequency and all the easy low hanging fruit in the micro architectural innovation was already implemented. So, right, a new feature would require more transistors, but you cannot dissipate power, right? Because each transistor produces some power. So, right, and so somewhere here is like frequency almost stays unchanged, right? And this is where we are. So, this is like uh, graph for 212. The textbooks probably have something from 2021. But essentially, right now, in order to build fast software, you really have to program for the architecture. And sometimes use accelerators, or sometimes means almost always. Practical examples, which everyone of everyone is running right now, is your essentially crypto accelerator. So, like all of this you know, video as well, right? So uh, all of these devices have a crypto accelerators which allow you to quickly encode it, like encrypt and decrypt data, right? But there was more like, obviously you have, you've heard about GPUs, you've heard about network accelerators and stuff like that, right? So, and it will become harder. And so that's why here, unless you know what's going on underneath, you can't really build, build fast software, right? I know, I'm tired as well. Okay, so uh, we'll get to the performance again. It's just, just, just an introduction here. But just to give you an overview of what is there inside a typical machine, right? Because typically, like we all kind of know, but again, my goal is to make sure that we're not afraid. We can like essentially disassemble this piece of hardware, see what's inside. So my example here is just a typical uh, kind of like top of the line or decent motherboard from five years ago, right? So most of you probably tried buying it, but it has, it has a slot in which you attach a CPU and a bunch of slots with memory dims here, right? And there will be some slots for graphic cards uh, on a PCI bus, which connects them, right? So kind of like there will be wires going to this like PCI controller over here. It's another microchip and then connected to the CPU as well, right? And the memory bus will connect you to those dims, right? So but typically, I mean, most of you probably at once in your life bought a CPU, right? We decided to upgrade, so what you have inside is, this is a picture of one CPU, which Intel calls a socket, right? Uh, it has four cores, so one, two, three, and four, and each core has two logical threads, which are called hyper threads, right? Well, later in the class, we'll explain how those hyper threads are built, but at least we know that, okay, uh, if I do something like uh, here in my, my little, Machine can talk CPU in four. I will have it says okay, you have eight CPUs. In practice, I have four, and each of them has two logical threads, right? Sorry, I can make it larger slide. Right? So it's the same for you, for most of us, right? So that's how we run it. The interesting, I mean, there's nothing super surprising here. So each of these cores is connected to memory, right? So again, nothing so super special. Memory is a simple abstraction. You can either write a value into an address. Right? And it returns nothing. And if you read, it will return you a most recently written value, right? That. Uh, and if I, if we again, if we tear this apart, either your wonderful phone or a laptop, that will be roughly the organization of your machine. So it will be a CPU with some number of cores, 
course connected through a memory bus to memory and something what is called a PCI bus uh, will connect it to other devices. So you will have a, like today it's popular to have NVMe devices, right? Non-volatile memory attached on the PCI bus. You might have a network interface connected to the PCI bus and you might have uh, uh, your old disks, which are SATA controllers or USB devices connected behind another chipset, which is called often South Bridge, but doesn't matter. So it's just like the high level picture here. It's think of it as a network, right? Kind of a distributed system in which CPU is connected to other things, right? And uh, if you look at uh, the data center, again, it might be a little bit intimidating. This is a picture from Emilab, which is next door here, right? At the University of Utah. And they specifically use this Dell R830 four socket servers, right? So what is this Dell? This is the blade. So this is one of those guys here. I mean, obviously there will be different uh, servers, but roughly speaking, it's again, it's the same machine, right? Uh, so again, it's a four socket machine, so it will be four cores. Each of these cores will have memories local to them. You can guess that access to local memory is faster than accessing this remote memory. It's called non-uniform memory architecture. It's a different number of cycles. But and same like local devices on the local PCI bus are a little bit closer to you than, than the ones which are remote, right? And if you take a look at uh, what this blade is inside, it's actually like kind of two floors. Uh, one floor contains two sockets and the other one contains two more. This is the picture of motherboard. You just wanted to make, my goal here is to essentially just to make sure that if you never looked inside, this is what's inside. And so you don't have to be scared. And as, as we'll be moving forward, it will become clear to specific degree, like CPUs go here, here, uh, to a specific degree that uh, this is this is the hardware. Okay, I'll probably stop here and we'll start on this what CPU is doing internally next time. If there are any last minute questions, so this is the end of the class, right? So like, right, 1250? Ah, 110. And I was rushing, sorry. <laughs> Okay, hold on, guys. Since uh, if we have time, we'll, we'll move on. Sorry, I have 20 more minutes, and I was thinking, why is it I'm so late? But yeah. So the question, the question was, uh, what am I supposed to write down? Uh, and that's a good question. So right now, again, this is an introduction lecture. So here you can just listen. Uh, in the lectures, which are more specific, where we go about, go and describe a bit of a digital circuit or branch predictor. I'm wondering because when you brought up, I believe they would want to be able to explain how to tell the database building. I had no idea what you were referring to with regards to cycles and threads. Yeah, no, that's a good question. First of all, I appreciate the question because we will go and explain what cycles are, right? But, and I'm, I should admit, yeah, I didn't realize that people might not understand what cycle is. So cycle is essentially, uh, it's a timing mechanism which allow you to, to do a small step in your digital circuit and then save intermediate results, right? But roughly speaking, when you buy a machine, right, you typically look at the clock speed, right? Whatever, it's 2.2 gigahertz or like 2.4, right? And roughly, uh, as we will understand later, in one cycle, typically you can execute one instruction. In practice, you will execute a little bit more, but roughly what I want to you to understand that in one cycle, there will be one instruction under good conditions, right? So, and again, I don't think you need to, uh, you, you don't need to remember anything specific from today besides just the general picture of what's coming. So we will go, and in my next lectures, we will start building small digital circuits. So we will first, like, this is like this is actually the beginning of what's coming. So I will try to explain what's going on inside the CPU, right? What, what CPU is doing, right? And uh, I will try to explain then how we can build a simple CPU out of digital circuits. So we will first go through assembly, 
And uh, assembly is a just human readable representation of what machine can understand. Your digital circuits essentially see bits, right? And assembly is just for you to read what you kind of execute, right? And uh, and there you will be essentially noting down that okay, this is this is how it goes. And uh, I understand that today it's a little bit high level, and I again um, there is probably more than than you can Im immediately understand. The goal is that for people who are who are like proficient uh, in developing stuff in C or whatever language you like. Uh, the, the the point which I was trying to make is that there is another layer underneath, and the way you should look at it, it's not just your language, but there is a lot going on underneath, and you have to understand, you have to be able to reason about the performance of those layers, and we'll gradually get there, so don't worry about today. Yeah. Say again? You have to, you need to know C, no. For this class? Uh, I was thinking of doing uh, one lab assignment and see if you, if there will be, we'll do a poll. If people are struggling to simple C, which I will probably pre-populate, we'll figure a way up around it. It's just that C is almost assembly. So it's uh, when you look at C, because the abstractions are so thin underneath, you can kind of predict, you can see through this code and, and guess what the machine instructions will be generated and what is running. If you're running something like Java, there will be a runtime, you know, garbage collector, stuff like that. Uh, not even like just, even the Rust, which compiles to bare metal, will have language level abstractions like ref cell or what, no, I don't know how much you know about Rust, but they can see like a template. What does it expand into? Like what, what kind of code gets generated? So it, it gets, it's get hard. C is one of the simplest languages which allow you to, to reason about performance. And this is what people are struggling with. They say, okay, we want this performance transparency just because we want to understand what the machine will be doing. Because if we're optimizing every cycle, that's what you want to do. Any other questions? Okay, sorry. So I get it wrong once, but let's go into this. Okay, so and I was rushing, which was kind of bad. So any, then I can step back a little bit. Any questions about those motherboards and organization of the machine? Do you understand this picture? Uh, let me scroll back a little. This one. Uh, sorry. So essentially, my goal here was to explain to you that these blazing data servers, and when you when you hear a word data center, you shouldn't run away. First of all, it's next door. You can go and see. The Google data center is just larger, but essentially it's the same. And this is one. It's it's, it's a sizable example. Each element of this data center is a blade server, uh, which contains essentially the same motherboard, just instead of like, if my laptop has one CPU core, or not one, one CPU socket, this guy has four. And again, what I wanted to emphasize here, I don't know how much you know about uh, parallel programming or like programming of applications which run on multiple cores at the same time. So here, it's not just multiple cores, but it's multiple sorts. And I want to, wanted to emphasize the fact that it's, it looks like a distributed system, although it's physically like on the same piece of, uh, it's the same uh, motherboard, right? I said it's two floors, it's connected with those links. And this is how it logically looks. Again, my goal here was not to scare you, but instead kind of like, you the layers and claim that this is what's inside. Don't get scared. So very much similar stuff is running on your phone and on your laptop, right? It's just a little bit more and a little bit more reasoning about why stuff is running slow or running fast, right? So if this is your laptop, and again, I wanted to emphasize that the peripheral devices like network cards, USB controllers, uh, Full uh, state disks, right? They are connected to a network. So essentially, you're running a tiny network around inside your machine. It takes time to communicate with this network, right? Uh, but that was my kind of goal here. Just to make sure that we, again, uh, before I open a phone myself, I, I was thinking, what's inside, right? I, it's, it's kind of hard every time, even when you move from x86, which is warm and fuzzy for me to something like ARM or MIPS, it gets a little tricky because everything is slightly different and you, you don't always know how it works, right? So, okay, any questions about this? Okay, 
really good. So let's move slightly forward. And uh, I wanted in this last 10 minutes, which I have, I wanted to spend them explaining what the CPU does internally. Again, my goal here is not to scare you, but kind of convince you that it's relatively simple. So CPU is actually is doing something what is called this fetch decode execute loop, right? So roughly speaking, this is the logical diagram of almost every CPU which you kind of ever meet in your life, right? It's just generic. I mean, there are different architectures, like FPGAs are different, right? So, but what happens here, imagine like the CPU essentially repeatedly reads instructions from memory, right? And it's kind of, I think it's intuitive to you, right? So there is a couple of pointers. Let's say there is one which is called instruction pointer IP and on x86 it's called R because it's 64 bit version. This, this is just an address which points in memory, right? Inside this memory, there will be some instruction. I wrote just addition here, add, which for example, adds two registers and puts something in a third register, right? It's hypothetical. So this instruction doesn't really exist, but it's close enough, right? And uh, what CPU will be doing, it will just say, okay, what's my next instruction pointer? Maybe you had a jump and you know, it, it, it was an if then else statement and you jump not to the next instruction, but somewhere else. Or maybe you invoke a function with a call instruction, right? And we will get to what these instructions are in MIPS because in this class we'll be going through MIPS. And if it's just uh, like the next address, so essentially the size of this instruction, maybe it takes like five bytes here. And so you're essentially all day P plus five, right? And you just read the next location in memory. What CPU will be doing, it will fetch this instruction because CPU doesn't know what's there, right? So it will go and read this memory. Uh, so essentially just somehow from memory, this will be moved to the CPU, right? At this point, the CPU has to do what? It has to decide what is that I have to do with it? Maybe it's an addition, maybe it's a subtraction, maybe it's a jump or some other instruction, right? Comparison. So it will do it this decode, right? Decode means that it will take bits which represent this instruction, zeros and ones which are sitting here, and essentially just figure out what kind of instruction is that, right? And if there are some registers involved in execution of this instruction, it will read the registers because registers are kind of like a very fast cache. It's so fast that you can read them in the same cycle. Because I told you that the first level cache takes two to three cycles to read, but it's too slow because you want to execute instruction every cycle, right? So there will be a tiny register file here on the CPU itself in silicon, right? And caches are also in silicon there, but they just kind of put it away. So it takes some time to, to read from them, but they are larger, right? So you will read the registers. And at this point, you can execute the instruction. So essentially, and this is what we're going to build in this class. We will build a simple LU, for example which if it's an addition, it will add two numbers and it will output a third number on the output wires, right? And then you will do register write, kind of saving this uh, thing in back, back into register and then eventually you will save probably register in memory, right? So relatively speaking, easy, right? And then again, like there is a couple of edge conditions here. Maybe you're trying to divide by zero. Why division by zero is bad? So because after that, your computation doesn't have a meaningful outcome, right? It's undefined. There is no such number which you can multiply uh, by the result to get back. Uh, so if you're dividing like five by zero, right? There is no number here which you can multiply by zero to get back five, right? So it doesn't make, doesn't make sense to continue because no matter which, how, which answer you will receive, it's just bogus, right? So it doesn't have a meaning. So that's why CPU can raise an exception. And you probably have seen it, you know, like people who program in Java, C, right? You've seen exceptions. So, and uh, some logic on the CPU can go ahead and like process it, but not, if nothing like that happens, you essentially say, okay, I will commit the results of this instruction saying that, okay, no exceptions happen, so okay, this result which uh, was produced can be saved in registers, right? And then go ahead and generate the next instruction pointer. As I was saying, if it's a control flow instruction which jumps somewhere in memory, it might change your 
instruction pointer to somewhere over here, right? And then you will, in the next iteration of this fetch decode execute loop, you start fetching from here, right? From this location in memory. But if it doesn't happen, then you just simply essentially increment instruction pointer by the size of the current instruction. And you move on, move on again to this, uh, to the next iteration of this loop. And this is pretty much what is happening in the CPU. So essentially you always execute this loop. Any questions about it? So it, as simple as it gets. And that's why you say, okay, well, you just showed us a Linux booting in a, in a web browser. So I kind of claim that if you can encode this loop in your favorite language, be it C, Rust, or C++, or whatever, even, even Python, right? If you have a piece of memory in your language, which you say, this will be my machine memory, if you put like a Linux kernel somewhere there, you can start executing instructions one by, by one by one, right? And it gets a little bit tricky because there is virtual memory, which will get a little bit later, uh, stuff like that. But you can say, okay, there is no virtual memory. It's just as simple as it gets. The only complexity here is essentially doing the decoding. And if your instruction set is simple, is simple like MIPS, this decoding is virtually trivial. If it's x86, it gets a little hairy, right? But you can see that, okay, if I give you a homework assignment, build me this emulator or a simple instruction set like MIPS, you probably, you're not going to fail. And it's relatively easy. And that's what's going on in, in, in a CPU, except that in a CPU, it, this loop is implemented in hardware. Essentially, it's just bits of digital logic, which, which essentially implement the same logic, which was just on the whiteboard just a second ago. So essentially it does instruction fetch. You have this register, which is called the program counter here, which is in my previous slide was called instruction pointer. It fetches something from memory, right? Because it just points in memory, right? And you have this instruction read here. And typically this is one cycle because uh, we use cycles to essentially save intermediate results. Uh, because if you, you can build a giant circuit, but then okay, it's harder to synchronize it. And so the outputs and inputs of the on the wires will not be essentially in a steady state, right? So here, this stage is called, you can think of, a, of a, a intermediate register or a latch, and it saves essentially whatever you read from memory here will be saved here until the next cycle, right? And then you know you hear like this is your decoding logic, and it's just shown with a wire here, we will essentially talk through this TPU and we'll understand how it's implemented. But there is a register file from which you read. So essentially if your instruction here contains like something, a number read something from register one, you will read here from register one and we'll save this result into this intermediate latch, right? And in the next cycle, depending on what operation you're doing, this LEU, which is a digital circuit, which does addition, subtraction, stuff like that, right? It will produce you the sum of these two values, which are essentially where first read from the register file, got saved here, then they go through the addition and then saved here as an intermediate result, right? And here, depending on what you're executing, right? You can either write back to memory or you will have later this line here, which allows you to write result back into the register file, right? And here is your logic for next program counter. Unless it's a control flow instruction, which changes it, you just essentially just, uh, there's this adder, two, 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 ah, which adds plus four. Imagine all your instructions are four bytes long, right? And then you keep it here, next sequential PC. Then this next sequential PC goes back here. And again, we go, we'll go back for the, for the details of this five stage pipeline. Like that's essentially the goal of this class to understand the details how it works. But again, in my intro lecture, I just wanted to get to this point. That first, I wanted you to explain that, okay, CPUs are relatively simple unless you get, like, dig, start digging into optimization details. And second, it's, it's actually possible to understand how to build them in this digital logic. Okay, I'm almost there. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. So, questions, we still have maybe a minute. Anything? 
Uh, it will be posted on the class web page. The class web page. This one. But I will add it to Piazza as well. Oh, not to Piazza, to Canvas. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that, uh, I'm interested in learning more about the Verizon project. Where should I 